If Reality Check Radio enriches your day and life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. Annie O'Brien comes from a digital marketing background and recently spent a year working in Parliament for the Leader of the Opposition as the Director of Digital. She's been heavily involved in women's rights advocacy and is a founding council member of the Free Speech Union. She joins me on the line now. Annie O'Brien, welcome to The Crunch. It's good to have you on Reality Check Radio. I think this is your first Reality Check Radio appearance. It is. Thank you. It's, um, <laughs> it's good to be chatting with you. Now, you're involved with the Free Speech Union mm-hmm. um, and a couple of other activities around the place, but I, I wanted to touch on the importance of free speech, particularly in some of the key issues that we're seeing arise in New Zealand now and some of the ones in the past where we have seen almost a censorious application about free speech by politicians, by the mainstream media and others, and and why it's so very important to have people like you with voices out there that are saying, no, hang on, you need to hear us. And Mm -hmm. I guess... I guess the biggest one is at the moment, well, you know, that we saw in the in the past twelve months was the turf wars. That that you know, I call them the turf wars. And I've had Rachel Stewart on the program, and you know, I'm on your side here. On on this one, right? <laughs> there, there's men and there's women, right? That's it. There's mm-hmm. no men masquerading as women. That's they're, they're just men in a frock. That's the way I look at it. But mm-hmm. we've got this. We see it in the media, we see it in many of the political parties, this uni thought that it's okay for men to pretend to be women and we can call them women and we can change all our language and everything all around that and actually use the patriarchy, this is what I always say, using the patriarchy to subject women even further Um, because it's men telling women what they can say and think, right? Yeah. It it is the ultimate um, kind of epic move by the patriarchy to to find a way to, I get cuckoo bird and get in the nest and say, no, we're the right kind of woman. We're the most woman kind of woman there are. And you other, you know, biological ones, you listen to us um, and, and we can tell you how it's got to be. And so it's incredible to me that, you know, for about 10 years now I've been saying, no, you don't tell me what I can do with my spaces, my sport. Um, you certainly don't put women in more danger in places like prison or um, domestic violence shelters. Um, I'm saying no. And then I look around and there was all these women saying, oh, no, we're fine with that. And I was just like. Aren't they traitors? Uh, yeah, I um, I think there's a, there is a, a mixture. There are some who are what I would called The Cool Girl. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you've you've read or seen the movie The um, Gone Girl. There's a monologue in it about the cool girl who says, pick me, I'm different, I, you know, I'm so cool, I'll do yeah. exactly what I want, basically. So I think there's an element of that where, especially on the left, you see these women who will sign away every right that we've ever won in order to get a pat on the back. And, by and, ha- and fought hard for those rights too. I mean, you know, New Zealand is with the first, was the first country uh, that uh, gave women the vote. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Right? Men already had the vote. So, hmm. you know, yeah. It's, it's, there's, there's a lot of that um, cool girl stuff. But then I also think that, that fear has been the massive weapon used here. Women tend to be more agreeable because of how we're socialized. I missed that lesson, I think. Um, <laughs> you and Rachel Stewart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we both missed that lesson. Missed that. You were wagging school that day. <laughs> exactly. But the, but on the whole, you know, we're socialized to be more agreeable and to want to be more nurturing and, and loving and those kind of things. And so you find that women are like, oh, you know, these they're very um, depressed men who um, think that they're women and we, we should do whatever we can to make them happy and safe and da 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 da. And they really buy into that narrative of, you know, these are the most vulnerable people around because that's what's pushed. And then they're afraid to not acquiesce, not go along with it because they'll be called names. They'll be told they're they're bad and they're mean and that they want them to die and all that kind of thing. And so it's really been all the disagreeable women like myself 
who who have said no, you're not a woman. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, this is the the thing that fascinates me. We, if you get a nine year old come up to you and says, "Look, Dad, um, I, I want to share a bottle of whiskey with you," get hammered. You'd give them a clip around the ear and send them to their room and said, "Don't be stupid, right?" <laughs> If they if they came to you and said, "Look, Dad, I'm nine years old. I'm I'm really interested in uh, finding out about sex. Can you take me to the local brothel um, and you know just supervise and everything?" You'd say, "Go to your room. You're grounded." Yeah, no. But but a nine year old comes up and says, "Dad, look, I think I'm a girl. Um, I'm going to start wearing dresses. And can I take all of these puberty blockers?" It seems that they go, "Oh, sure, no problem. You know, yeah. we're okay with that." It's it's and incredible. incredible. It's incredibly regressive again, though, because the, the nine-year-old says to you, I think I'm a girl. The reason for that is because he probably really likes feminine stereotypical toys and presentation. Um, so he probably likes to play in the same ways that some of the girls in his class play in. And when you when we say as a society, if you want to play with those toys, you have to be a girl. We're telling this this little boy that the only way that he can, you know, play with those toys or like glitter or whatever it is, is if he becomes a girl. When really, I think kids are kids. Just let them play what they want to play with, and generally they their own grow way, up. won't they? Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> you can't learn to ride a bicycle first time. You you come off, you you get mm. scabbed knees, you stub your toes, you get everything wrong, and in the boy's case, you managed to land on the crossbar, you know, it, it's like <laughs> hell, you know. But you learn, don't do that. Um, but my dad got- bribed me. He bribed me. If I taught myself how to ride my bike, I'd get the Britney Spears CD. Right. So I taught myself how to ride my bike. <laughs> you really wanted that CD, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know it's, it's insane what society does and contorts itself. But we, we – I, I'm still gobsmacked by the scenes that we saw uh, when Posey Parker uh, came to New Zealand, where a bunch of angry men, uh, mm-hmm. largely, were physically intimidating a smaller group of women who mm-hmm. just wanted to hear somebody speak. Yeah, now, you were involved in that, weren't you? Yeah, I was right, right in the thick of it. it was yeah. it was frightening and. Um, I felt so bad because I'd, I'd had a conversation with Posey the night before and she said, well, like, it's really heating up down there. Like, um, and she said, will the police be okay? And I said, what do, what do you mean, will the police be okay? And she said, are they going to, you know, do you think that they'll, you know, protect us? Mm. And I said, yes, <laughs> because in all my experiences in New Zealand, I've, I was naive enough to think the police show up and protect those who are being attacked or, like, you know, that I just assumed that even if they disagreed with what she had to say, they would protect her against physical attack. Mm. I said that, and then the next day, as this group of men, as you say, dismantled a fence and ran at us, and I looked around and there were police nowhere, I just had this dread of like, oh my God, I've given her this false sense of security here. And the reality is that we've been left completely on our own. That they're not here. I ended up ringing 111 from the middle of the melee and got a really shitty um, responder on the, on the phone. Mm. And I was saying, you know, like, there are women trapped in the rotunda and like I think these men are going to hurt them um and they're being pulled at and pushed and um and the guy on the phone was just like yeah we know about it and I was like but there's no cops here and they're like we've had lots of calls about it Mm. I was like well is anyone coming because literally yeah and it was just the, the private security who were holding the crowd back from Posey, she was getting pulled and pushed. And it was like, it was really primal, some of it. Like it really scared me because it was the type of thing where, you know, you hear about um, people kind of, or, or like 
mass hysteria or something where, mm. where a mob kind of gets whipped up into a frenzy. Yeah. And it kind of felt like that because they they look wild. Like, and so I kind of thought, what is the end point of this? If they get to her, are they just they're gonna rip her apart? Yeah, I, like, I know someone <laughs> who was in that melee with with you, you know, um, and uh, she she said she was frightened, frightened yeah. for her life. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the news media and the police all took the side of of yeah. the of them. Uh, it, it, it was astonishing. I, I was actually um, quite interested on the weekend. I think it was Nicola Willis and, and Lapson were ushered out of the gay out mm. because of the mob there. The Palestinian that was the protesters. Same people, same yeah. people who did that to us. Because there's only a small community of these psychopathic bloody activists, and they were the same ones. They're the same ones who do all the very aggressive Palestine stuff. And what was interesting to me was they were being nowhere near as aggressive as they were towards us. They would seem to be shouting nasty things, but they weren't yeah. being physical like they were with us. And Luxon and Willis's police contingent got them out of there. They saw the risk. They saw yeah. it was dangerous. They got them out of there. And I kind of, it just made me a bit cross because I was like, Every politician from all the different parties said, oh, you know, it's mostly, mostly peaceful protests, da, 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 da. It wasn't. It was hugely violent and yeah. aggressive. And a fraction of that happened at Big Gay Out, and they were swept out by police. Yeah. I find it astonishing that politicians pander to these groups. I mean, they do. Yeah. Um, you see the Green Party especially, right? But mm. but. You know, the, the vast majority of people who would have been at the big big gay out or any of these sort of events, they're not national voters. They're not ACT voters either. So I don't know why David Seymour and Nicola Willis and Chris Bishop and Luxon all go prancing around in their colourful shirts like they care because they don't. Yeah, it's interesting because I think it is fair again. It's the media is hugely plugged into this community. I hate using that because I'm supposedly... Well, it's not a community though, is it? It's no. not a community. <laughs> yeah. So my partner and I usually go to Big Gay Out because yep. it's usually the one that's more chilled. It's usually the one not like the parades and stuff where yep. it's, you know, yep. all the telcos and stuff dressed up. Um, usually there's music and drinking and it's quite fun. Um, we didn't go this year and I'm glad we didn't because of the protests and stuff that, that kind of ruined the whole thing. But it is like last year when we went, it was, there was a lot of political stuff. Um, everyone who went on the stage was making political statements about um, Wayne Brown. Yeah. So there was, I think he just kind of floated that he was going to cut um, funding to arts or something. Yeah. And so they were all making a big deal out of it. And what I noticed was these were the people going on the stage. These were the performers and the, the people who organised it. You look around at those sitting on the lawn with us. We were all rolling our eyes every time a political statement was made because even though most of them would have been left voters, people are just sick of it being politicised. They just want to, like, get a bit drunk and have a dance, you know? Like, yeah, everything has become this, this absolute political mess. And it, like, I almost think we should tell all the politicians to fuck off and not come to these things, because why do we want them there? Well, I mean, I don't get it. It's like, you know, did you see News Hub the other night doing this big story about how NZTA or Waka Kotahi had specially bought these vests with no branding and it cost $304. Where are they and buying them for? From? <laughs> this is, it cost $304 for 17 of them. They, 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 they cost a Big Mac chips and a Coke. But here's News Hub. That this is exactly what we're talking about. It's a different topic, but it's exactly what we're talking about. We've got News Hub making this big song and dance about $304. Of course, they never made a song and a dance when um, uh, various different ministers turn up and get given a jacket from civil defense or whatever they call themselves 
Um, Jacinda Ardern, there's a million photos of her wearing orange vests and yeah. all these day glow things. Same with Christopher Hitchens. But I'm sitting there thinking, why do they, why do the politicians play dress up? It, 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 there's, there's no safety issues here. The road's been opened or, or <laughs> it's completely devoid of any machinery or anything like that. It's about to have cars roll down it. Um, and they have them all tip up wearing a hard hat, safety glasses, and, and, and a fluoro vest. It, yeah. Isn't that kind of the same as attending Big Gay Out? It's just so they can tick a box to say, look at me, I did this. I think um, it's mostly to do with the media. And I'll use an example of um, when I worked for Judith Collins when she was the leader. Um, so I was travelling with Judith. We were down in Queenstown. And we went to, after dinner, me, her, I think Shane Retty was there and Joseph Mooney. We went to get an ice cream after dinner and it was um, still, there was still some COVID restrictions. So we yeah. were wearing masks and whatnot. Literally, we were wearing the masks. Judith stepped forward to collect her ice cream, took her mask off to eat it. Um, and someone obviously not friendly to her politics, filmed that few mm. seconds without the wider context. Yep. I then spent that evening on the phone getting all the questions from the journalists, like it was Judith had committed the most massive crime. I'm not sure if you remember, but it was... It was I, I never wore a mask, news. so I don't know what the fuss is all about. <laughs> It was it was all over the news. It was it was a main story for the next few days. Was I know, that she it's ridiculous. not put her mask on? And so sometimes these politicians and, and these staffers are literally just trying to avoid a shitstorm in the media. They're just like, okay, if we do this thing, then it's one thing the media can't blow up. And to be honest, that is more centre right parties. That you know, yeah, I, yeah, I doubt yeah. whether that would have happened to Jacinda. You're never going to see Winston Peters having a thought about that. What if this ends up in the media? He'll be thinking, oh, awesome, it's going to be in the media. <laughs> in That's the what bunch. I want. <laughs> no such yeah, thing no, as bad news. True. That is true. But I think it is symptomatic of national, to to a different extent, Labour. Those centre parties are so reliant well, they feel they are, on the legitimacy from the media that they tie themselves in knots to try and placate. Now, the problem is, I think, that that we need to reassess the, um, I guess, equation there because we're now in a situation where the 6 o'clock news is not the be-all be and end-all. Um, you know, it used to be you needed to hit, you know, have your press releases out in time for the six and a o'clock news. You wanted to get those tops. Yeah, those those days power. are done now. Yeah, that's it's done. And so now you've got a whole different set of media, but also you've got the ability to bypass the media, which yeah. is you guys are doing with your own new media type, but yep. also social, but also by list building and, and direct emailing. Yes, and which so, is what the which is what the free speech union does, builds those yeah. list emails, emails direct, bypasses exactly. the media and gets the message that you want out there, not this homogenized, cut down 30 second sound bite that the media like to to use. Yeah. And I think we're seeing like you, you used Winston as an example. And mm. um he is showing that it is possible to not play the media game and use your alternative channels to get your message across. I think it could be done better, um, but for what he's trying to achieve, it's working. Now, Luxon is never going to do that because he is down the centre, national, safe, <laughs> if you will. But it's um, not safe, is it? Because You've no. got, you've got, this is, I always hark back, this is a free speech issue. If you've got a media that are hostile, mm -hmm. they are stifling your views or um, whoever you're representing, in your case, the mm. free speech union, and the media are deciding we're not going to carry this. Mm. This isn't news. And so they are acting as censors against the message that you're putting out, whether it's um, in terms of free speech, in terms of Pauli Parker or mm. dissenting views. And I, I, like, I like all views. 
right? You, you could be completely opposed to my politics and I'll still defend your right to say whatever you want, no matter how silly it well, that's is. That's what we're doing at the Free Speech Union, right? Like the amount of times where we've fronted stuff that we don't agree with, but, but you have to, right? You know, for example, and sometimes we deliberately speak on issues that are counter. So I have fronted the Bethlehem College stuff because mm. I'm gay. And actually, um, you know, I don't disagree with them on everything anyway, but I wanted to, to show I can come out here and defend um, Bethlehem College's um, rights to speech and to what they teach. Um, and it shouldn't matter if that is in an alignment with my own views, my own life. Um, likewise, you know, we've we've got um, Jewish members on our council who have defended the, the Palestinian protesters, um, you know, pro-Palestine rallies and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think it's actually really important to demonstrate a willingness to stand by the principle uh, rather than um, picking and choosing the issue and then yeah. saying, you know. Free speech is an absolute, isn't it? There's no but after. You know, I believe in free speech. You can't now say but and then mm. add something that says that you don't believe in free speech. You either do or you don't. And it's quite funny. A lot of people can't grasp the concept. Like often I'll criticise someone um, on Twitter, say. I'll say, you know, that was an appalling thing to say. I've said it about Chloe Swarbrick's uh, mm. behaviour at the pro-Palestine rally. So yeah. I've, been very critical of it. And people will say, well, what about her free speech? I'm saying, oh, I'm not impacting her free speech. I'm using she, my own speech. She's allowed to, to say, say it, but we're also yeah. allowed to say that that's shit. Yeah. <laughs> that's know? the thing. It's like I'm, I'm not coming for her at all. I'm just saying, well, that's appalling and it has these consequences, mm. you know, challenging her, in which case I've had my free speech to criticise her. She's had her free speech to say shitty slogans, and, and that's all good. But people just struggle with the concept, and I just find myself having to explain it over and over and over. But well, we've had it here at Reality Check Radio. You know, I interviewed uh, somebody, and they had strong views. And they were very polite in the way that like, interviews with me are convivial. Right? They're never mm -hmm. hostile. I'm not about trying to bash anybody up, trying to prove a point. I just want to have a conversation. And in having that conversation, we can find out where, where people think or what what direction they're going in. And if you don't have those conversations, you don't find out. But the vitriol that came from that saying, well, you should be saying it from this perspective. You should be doing it from that perspective. Mm. You know, we had on the treaty principles um, issue, we had um, a number of different views from David Seymour to Margaret Mutu to um, a couple of others, and there were people saying right. we don't want we don't want that woman on on our show. We don't want her saying those things. That, that's appalling. You shouldn't have her on the show. But Reality Check Radio was founded because there literally is no other media out there that lets people have their say, that lets mm -hmm. the guests have their say, and that we can impart knowledge and information and then people can decide for themselves whether they like that or don't like that or are ambivalent towards it. And, and, and even so our important. major competitor is hostile to particular points of view. And I don't mm. believe that we are. And certainly on my show, I try not to be hostile to particular points of view. I might not agree with somebody, but I want to hear what they've got to say. That And that's how it should be. I mean, taking that example of the Treaties Principle Bill, the polarisation and toxicity that we've seen before mm. the bill is even written is so concerning. And I lay a lot of the blame at the feet of the media, perhaps even Absolutely. more than the politicians, um, because of their framing has created a real fear on one side and anger on the other. These are not good combinations. And no. so I it is completely responsible to platform people with various views on the subject and allow people to make up their own minds. But also, it would have been amazing if, if it had been made clear that this bill hasn't been written and everyone's kind of talking about these concepts, but we don't know what we're arguing over yet. And I mean, so that's, a, that's the huge thing. I saw all these people at Waitangi talking about how um, David Seymour was going to abolish the treaty and rewrite the treaty. Both of those things are lies, yeah. right? What he's saying is 
there's no principles in the treaty, but we've got laws that say that we have to honour the principles of the treaty. How can we make that happen if we don't know mm. what the principles are? Let's have a debate. And all hell has broken loose. Absolutely. And they're trying to silence him and silence anybody else who has a differing opinion that of this wonderful woke view that the head of the British Empire, Queen Victoria, in all of her magnificent glory as the Empress of India and everything else, signed a very unique document that was different from every other thing that the British Empire had ever done mm -hmm. and said, you disparate groups of, of various different tribes represented by these senior people are all on a level, same level as me. Mm -hmm. well, well, that's just a heroic assumption to, to, to understand that the, that's just not true. You know, you can look well, at... That's, that's what I struggle with. I, I mean, I'm undecided, to be honest, on, on mm. the principles bill because I don't know what it will achieve, but I'll make that decision once I've well, let's seen hear it. Bill and, 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 you know, however, I do struggle with the ahistorical narrative that's being woven here. Um, not that I've really used it. I have a degree in history, and so... I guess I've spent a lot more time than maybe the average person on these issues because um, I did a bit of New Zealand history. Mm. And it is ahistorical to say that Māori did not give up sovereignty. Now, I can understand why people now would want to, to, to share that view. But you just have to go and read the speeches that were given at Waitangi, which are available online. Do a little Google. You just have to go to read. Um, there was a, a conference in 1860 at Koimarama, mm -hmm. um, a gathering of chiefs, and they were basically reflecting on, you know, it's been 20 years since the, the, the treaty's been signed, and they were reflecting on how things were and relationship with the crown, that kind of thing. Now, those speeches are very telling. You have um, a very clear um, deference to the Queen mm -hmm. um, and, and the idea of sovereignty is discussed explicitly. Now, another way to, to look at it is if you look at the speeches at Waitangi and you look at the chiefs who didn't want to sign and weren't happy with it, they express that they don't want to give up their sovereignty. So they know that's what's at stake. So if they're rejecting that, then the ones that did sign it were yeah. aware that was but what. We all have to forget on. this. And if we ever raise the historiosity of mm. all of this, we get held down with cries of racism. Yeah. And and that's that's what bullies do to silence people, isn't it? They give them a label that's ab abhorrent, that mm -hmm. you can't, you don't want to have that label put on you. So then you modify your speech mm -hmm. so that you don't get accused of that and then you're silenced. And they do it like the labels they give to people like you and, um, you know, where they say you're a turf. That's that's a derogatory insult designed to shut you up. It's incredible. I mean, I've been lucky here that the consequences haven't been as bad as it has for women overseas. Mm -hmm. So I've been called a Nazi, a turf, a racist, a transphobe, all the things you can think of. If you look at what's happened to some of the women in Australia when they were called Nazis, like like I was, they've had huge consequences. So now you've got several women uh, taking legal action against, um, I think it's the leader of the opposition in Victoria, uh, I believe, I can't remember his name, but um, he he basically defamed Posey Parker and Moira Deming, who was in his party, and um, a couple of other women who, who were organisers of one of Posey's um, John rallies. Pesuto. One, John Pesuto is his name. That's his name. That's the one. And so the consequences from for those women have been huge. The, the utilisation of the, the name Nazi, of the slur Nazi, mm. to say to these women, Moira Deming has, has just, she was attacked and now she's only able to take... Um, legal action, and it's probably going to take eleven years to go through the courts. Mm. And they do this because they know they have the power to harm us in this way. So when we're told that the most vulnerable group of people are this, this trans community, 
And we have to, to bow to them, everyone, because they're so vulnerable. It is extraordinary then that these same people can shut down our events, can destroy our careers. But they're vulnerable. Can, you know, they're supposed to be the vulnerable ones, and yet they have the power to make governments, media, just absolutely cut out to, to their wishes, you know. Even the most outrageous things, like I'm not sure if you've seen, um, it's come out yesterday, I believe, about the, the breast milk situation um, where uh, the NHS or one of the trusts of the NHS released um, research apparently or a statement that um, the artificially hormone-induced discharge from trans women's nipples is just as good for, for, for babies as mother's breast milk. That has required very senior people, you know, medical professionals and, you know, hospital administrator type levels to sign off on that. And it doesn't take a genius to know that men don't breastfeed and that anything that is artificially generated is not breast milk that's coming out. And yet something as apparent as this, it is the women calling it out who get told off and not the fetishists who are promoting men breastfeeding who, who are completely protected and, and even celebrated in some cases. Yeah. It, it's, this is what I don't understand because if I was a woman, and you know, oh, I guess I can be. Well, just now. tell me you are, and that's how yeah. it works, right? Yeah, I mean, when, <laughs> oh, oh, it's a funny anecdote. You know, when I had my stroke, I I couldn't walk properly and I couldn't use my right arm. And I said about doing rehabilitation, and some of that involved picking up a shotgun and competing in shotgun events and things like that. And a mate of mine said, Cam, why don't you, um, why don't you um, apply to go to the Paralympics? Um, but even better, why don't you apply to go to the Paralympics as a woman? Oh, and he says, you'd look great. And I said, oh, I'll wear a kilt. And I have my hairy legs hanging out the bottom. And I have my beard. And I'll say I'm a woman. I'll go into the into the Paralympics in the shooting, in the shotgun sports. And I, and I seriously thought about doing that just to take the piss. Um, well, a guy that I got to know through online years ago, Zuby, he's a um, kind of rapper, businessman type. He's He's half American, half British. Yeah. And he um, he became famous because he briefly identified as a woman, beat all of the deadlifting records, and then unidentified as a woman. Yeah, yeah um, I remember seeing that. He did it specifically yeah. because the record, in, I think it was the record in Canada, wasn't it, was held by a man pretending to be a woman mm -hmm. as the woman's yeah. Um, deadlifting record. So he went in there and blitzed him. It. But that's the thing. <laughs> You know, there's all these men that are declaring themselves women and competing in women's sports, mm -hmm. and I view their actions as similar, if not worse, because of the deception involved to people who wear medals that they never earned. And yeah, you know, they, 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 they're saying that they're a woman, they're entering the sports, they're swimming and beating everybody um, in the race. And then saying, look at me, I won a gold medal. But what I can't understand is the silver medal and bronze medalist just refusing to get I would if that was me, I'd refuse to get on the on the podium with it. I would yeah. speak out and and yes, you're probably gonna get demonized by your sport and band, mm. but principles are principles, aren't they? Well, that's like what I was talking about before about the motivation of fear. Um, mm. And I think now we're seeing many more women and girls speak out and refuse and that kind of thing, which is fantastic. But if you look at the example of, I'm not sure if you've seen Riley Gaines in, mm. in America. So she's the swimmer um, that spoke out against Leah Thomas, uh, yeah. the trans woman who, who was bloody useless in, in the bloke sport and then suddenly was winning all the women's sport. And well, that's the thing, isn't it? They're all hopeless as men. And then <laughs> like in order to make themselves feel better, they go and compete with women. And, like, and we what sort of man right is that? that? What, what was incredible about, like, when, when Riley talks about what she went through is mm. that it's not just the for, for swimming in this case. It's not just what happened in the pool, which is bad enough, the unfairness of it. 
But these young women were utterly gaslit in that they were not told that Leah was going to appear in their changing room with his dick out. And they turned around, were really alarmed. They, as a group, laid complaints and said, look, we don't want males in the changing room. They were lectured and told they needed to change their thinking. They needed to not be so horrible, blah, 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 blah. There was nothing they could do. In the end, they would take turns getting changed in cupboards because they felt so intimidated and also because Leah's behaviour was often sexualized. And that is a motivation here that we're not allowed to talk about. Um, The creepiness. Yeah, same with the breast milk thing. What reason would a man have, regardless of whether he thinks he has he's a woman, to need to breastfeed a child? Oh, come um, on, every bloke wants boobs to play with. <laughs> Some of them don't even have them. They're still trying to, you know, <laughs> yes. they haven't even had any surgery or anything. But, yeah. you know, there's the, the sexual element is something that we're not supposed to talk about. But if you visit, you know, the, the trans forums online, on Reddit, on anything like that, a, bit, bit of a lot me. of the motivation is, is sexual and um, it harms our ability to talk about this honestly and about the impact on women and children if we can't have honest conversations about that. And that is that we don't want to partake in the sexual fetish of a man. Well, that's what it is really, isn't it? It's... Mm-hmm. A bloke who wants to dress up like a woman. And, like, he can do that all he wants, but he doesn't have to come into my space. And This is the thing that I don't <laughs> get, right, is is that, okay, I, I'm heterosexual. Um, I'm not out there parading um, my sexuality everywhere mm. I go. I'm not out there demanding other people recognise my sexuality or people call me by certain things. I mean, if people wanted to call me, Something. I mean, I could insist my pronouns are ham- handsome and clever, but yeah, that's yeah. that's that's the ridiculousness of it all, isn't it? With, because it goes right down to mm-hmm. this this pronoun thing where people are dictating what other people can call you when they're talking about you and you're not in the conversation. Because because pronouns yeah. only occur in a third party when you're talking about somebody power. else, right? It's about power because. I have to say, at different times, I previously thought, okay, well, if I want to be polite, I can use the pronouns they want, whatever. And I've got to the point now where I don't because it, it, it's the slippery slope thing, right? It's the, the the politeness over pronouns becomes the demand to access the space that, oh, well, if you call me she, then you must see me as a woman. So I must be a woman, so I have to then be allowed into the space and the sport. And, and it kind of, like, goes from there. And it's about um, control. Like, you know, I wrote a piece for a mainstream publication recently, and I got it back edited with the pronouns changed. And I was like, do you know me? I am not going to, to have anything published that is playing these games. So I said, fine, I'll take it out and I'll just repeat their name over and over again because I'm not going to have those pronouns well, that's there. the thing, isn't it? If you're talking to somebody in person, like I'm talking to you, I'm not going to call you whatever your pronouns are. I don't know what they are. Mm. And frankly, I don't care. Um, to me, you're Annie, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to use your name. And if yeah. I'm talking about you to somebody else, I'm not going to say she this, and I'm say Annie said this and Annie said that. Mm. So it's this microaggression that's actually expanded to full-on aggression to control people on what they say. And it's exactly as you say, it's a power play to get you to conform. Mm. I mean, I previously worked in the the public service before I was in Parliament. Oh, I feel sorry for you. It was (laughs) It really was. Um, And what what I was so amazed by is the amount of time we spent before every meeting every hui, basically ticking these virtue virtue signal um, kind of um, things off. But actually, it it wasn't about virtue signaling. It was about power and control. It was the HR department was running the shop. Um, And so we had to, you know, say our pronouns. We had to do um, either a waiata or a karakia. And and I asked once because I said, look, I've got no problem with us doing you know, if we did some today stuff, that's okay. But I'm not religious. 
So why are we doing a car care? Like the, this is a public service. And that there are a whole lot of, you know, um, fox among the, um, the hens, whatever you say, because they know how to push back on um, we're doing this because it's really important that we honour Māori culture, but they don't know how to react when you're suddenly like, I'm not Christian, so why are we doing a Christian but, prayer? But if you look at the Karakias, they're actually not Christian anyway because they're talking <laughs> about the sky god and the tree god and the water god and all. Well, that's not Christian, is it? It's animism. No, I think the ones we, because the ones we did were, but um, I, yeah, I totally take that there would be a lot of um, but That's the thing, right? If I, if I was running a public organisation and I am a Christian mm. and I decided, right, we're going to start every meeting with a prayer and yeah. I'm going to call it a prayer and, and and it's going to be a Christian prayer, there would be howls oh. of outrage. The PSA yeah. would be mobilising people to march in the streets about this. The news mm. media would run it incessantly uh, until I caved and changed the mm. organisation. But mm. somebody says, are we going to have a karakia? Oh, okay, that's all right. Yeah. It's not all right. It's a waste There's of time. There's so much of that stuff that um, there is nothing wrong with if you want to um, do your karakia before you eat or before you, um, you know, when you're at home. If that's your thing, that is, that's great for you. Likewise, if you're into the pronoun thing and you and your friends want to talk about your pronouns all the time, Absolutely fine. But if you're working in the public service, why are we dedicating so much time to these performances? Oh, it's worse than that, though, Annie. Mm -hmm. I know somebody worked for um, the call centre business you know, during the COVID thing and phoning up, mm -hmm. and every Wednesday they'd have why are to Wednesdays. And yeah, up till 11 o'clock in the morning it was, you know, 15 yeah, renditions of 10. Well. Yeah, 15 yeah. renditions of 10 guitars, you know. <laughs> And, and and that was accepted. You now, if you said, "Oh, we're going to have a heavy metal Tuesday," people would be outraged. You know, but but because you call it Waiata Wednesday, it's all good. I did. Um, I did think of. I wonder if I could OAA how much time was spent on Waiata, <laughs> but there's no. <laughs> It's, it's no way insane. It, oh, the <laughs> other thing is is, but this is controlling speech. This is. Silence, like I was in court um, before Christmas and mm -hmm. I hadn't been in court for four or five years. And that's the time frame that it changed. And the previous time I was in court, you know, the, the judge comes in, everybody stands up. There's a few mumbled Maori words as they come in, which is read off a card. Mm -hmm. And then the judge sits down and then peers at everybody, you know, and says, who's first? And then somebody <laughs> stands up and says, oh, yes, it's Henry for the plaintiff or um, such and such for the defendant, and it, it's all done very quickly in about three seconds. Mm. Now, now that they stand up, oh, uh, yes, uh, and it's all in Maori, and they start uh, listing their whaka papa to multiple levels for 10 minutes, and then finally at the end of it, say their name and who they're representing. It's That's insane. Incredible. I mean, uh, I mean, I can understand if if the case is involving people who all kind of have that worldview. Great. Yeah, no, this this case but, had nothing to do with that. But and the thing that you know, it sounds trivial, but how long does that take? Our court system. I can tell you how long it took. It took twenty yeah. minutes. Yeah, like we are, we should be motoring through cases because you know there are people waiting. I, I know of one um, murder trial that's waiting to to go to court, and it's like taking three years. We should not be taking three years to hear homicide, you know, um, cases. Mm. Um, and and I think uh, we should be finding ways to speed these processes up. And so we we you know we set up these kind of um, authorities at like the Employment Relations Authority. We are to divert things out of the courts to hopefully, you know, speed things up. Those are now clogged now because they spend so much time pissing around. So it's like why this are we all, like this, this all comes down to free speech, right? Mm -hmm. it, everything comes down to free speech. And I always point out to people when they're talking about the United States, right? And they say, oh, it's terrible. You know, the, the Second Amendment in the United States is is appalling. And I said, well, you need to understand something. You can't have the First Amendment, which is the right to free speech, without having the right to defend that 
free speech, which is what the Second Amendment's about. Well, we don't have that in New Zealand, and so we 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 have this bully pulpit that's largely infested with the media mm. that uh, that is shutting people down, silencing people, bullying people. I mean, Nikki Hager stated that the reason why he wrote Dirty Politics was to take me out of the political discourse because mm. I was too effective at what I'm doing, and he wanted to silence the other journalists that were talking to me. Now, mm. I was, at that stage, I'd already had a high court judge determine that I was a journalist. So we mm. had a journalist, Nikki Hager, attacking another journalist for mm. the political ideas that person had that were opposed to, that Nikki Hager was opposed to, with the desired aim to silence that person, me, from mm. talking to other journalists to share ideas. And it was, nobody uh, said a thing. No, it was a mammoth hit job. But that's the thing is like there's always uh, people are scared of Nikki because he's I'm like not. this <laughs> because he's like this recluse who hides and then pops up with a book and doesn't give opportunity for right of reply, right? So he breaks you... all the rules of journalism, yeah. but everyone goes, yeah. Oh, he's a great journalist. No, he's not. He's a lying, sniveling scumbag who does hit jobs for money. Yeah. The exact things he accused me of doing. Yeah. It, the, I mean, maybe it was actually titled Dirty Politics because it was all dirty. And, <laughs> and, um, but they missed I, out all the interactions I had with Labour and Green politicians. For some strange reason, they weren't in the book. <laughs> I, I had Chris Trotter ring me up. He says, I don't know why Nikki Hag is complaining about dirty politics. All politics is dirty. I mean, it's yeah, it's exactly, it's Chris. Insane. You, you like, this. it is thrilling to work in politics, um, and I enjoyed almost every minute of it. It's the best but game out. It is like swimming with sharks all the time, and it's, I mean, and that's where it is, the world over, it's like that. There is no, like, nice parliament where everyone's holding hands and stuff, because that's not how things get, no. get done. We've got an adversarial system because that works. Because and, of a challenge of debate of ideas, yeah. one versus the other, right? It could be worse. We could be like, I think it's the Greeks or the Italians have punch-up all the time in the in the house, you know? Ta Taiwan it's, has regular punch-ups. Taiwan, yeah. Thailand, <laughs> fisticuffs in the parliament. I want to, We should bring that back, along with smoke. Well, Truman did give it a go, didn't he? Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, it's, uh, I, I think politics has been diminished since we got rid of smoke-filled rooms, but that's a whole other argument. <laughs> Winston would definitely uh, agree there. I think that the whiskey-drinking smoked um, smoke-filled rooms, um, yeah, it's a diff it was a different way of doing politics. And I've had people ask me, actually, um, how do you think Luxon's going to cope because he doesn't drink? And it seems like a really silly question, but there is like history the world over through through many different systems of the late night drink, the discussion, the the, the kind of relationship building. Um, and yeah, people can argue that that shouldn't be over alcohol, but it is. Well, so I mean, that's the thing. That's, I mean, I've got a multitude of stories from the 90s when I was sitting in the smoke-filled rooms watching deals get done, you know, mm -hmm. um, both internal party stuff and cross-party stuff. Deals were done over over fags and, and whiskey. And, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you mentioned earlier on in the interview about polarisation, and that's the thing that I find most frightening about how politics or how society has become. We are so polarised now, you, you're either right or wrong. There's no happy medium. There's no, well, hang on a second. You know, and I used to laugh about um, that um, Stephen Crowder, you know, he'd sit down at a university with some topic and say, you know, um, trans, tra yeah, trans, <laughs> women, trans women aren't real women, convince me, mm. <laughs> you know, or something like that, and have a discussion. But yeah. he, can't, he can't do that now because he just gets torn apart. Yeah. And we've well, lost the ability to debate. The security will usher him off because he's causing a, a disturbance. A disturbance. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do you think about Helen Clark and Phil Goff and, you know, all of that era of politicians? That's all they ever did is cause disturbances. Nowadays, they wouldn't oh, be allowed to. I know. It's it's quite amazing. Um, 
there's a lot of hypocrisy in it, like the sanitization of politics, the sanitization of protest. Um, it irritates me to no end because usually the people involved in that process from like from Labour's side, they they did protest, you know. Mm. Um, was it um Grant Robertson or Chris Hipkins that got arrested for a protest? Chris I Hipkins. Mm. Chris Hipkins. You know, and that's a point of pride for him. Yeah. Um, you know, and but then wanting to sanitize stuff now, same as with you know, of course you don't want bullying in Parliament, but it's also a very unique environment where you can't have staffers holding shit over ministers' heads or MPs' heads because it just doesn't work. Mm. Um, And yet Trevor Mallard, who is well-known as perhaps the naughtiest MP to ever be in Parliament in terms of drinking and punching and not getting on with people or bullying. Um, he brought in, you know, this investigation trying to, you know. He smeared an innocent person. He called a man who wasn't a rapist a rapist. I mean, that's one of the worst things, you know. And, think and about most the of the media didn't touch him. It was the, it was the bravery of Barry Soper that brought that to attention. Uh, yeah. And he and, and Mallard attacked Soper for that. Just <laughs> incredible. And I think, you know, I know nothing about the, the person who, who who he accused. And he might well have done other stuff, but he wasn't a rapist. No. Um, and so he he was utterly wrong to 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 call him that. And um, you know, and I said before, I've been called everything under the sun. And I actually, you know, as, as a female, I haven't been called that. And I think that would be possibly the most one of the most awful things you could be called. And and then the taxpayer had to pay a lot of money to to rectify that through After defamation. After he fought it as long as he could. Yeah, yeah. You know. So we paid hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, I mean, rightly so, that, that guy was entitled to it. But because of Trevor's lack of self-control, that happened. And, you know, and, and he changed the rules on alcohol. So, like, staffers, we couldn't drink in our in the offices um, unless there was like a, um, an MP present and like all this stuff. Back in his day, is everyone... they're more responsible than other people. <laughs> the staff <laughs> are more responsible. Yeah. Half the time, it's the staff that are saying to the MP or the minister, oh, "Perhaps you better not have another one, minister." <laughs> you well, know? Uh, that was the case. I know, like we'd be in Pickwick's, the bar in um, mm. in the Beehive, and. There would be a certain minister who uh, Jacinda Ardern had put on a no alcohol um, ban because of his behaviour, and he would show up in Pickwick's, and we'd be telling the the Labour staffers, "Hey, you might want to come and get your guy. He's here. He's here on the booze." And it's it's like actually, it's the staffers who are kind of um, making yeah. sure. Yeah, but the staffers, <laughs> the staffers, I, in my experience of. Of of seeing staff and ministers and MPs interaction, I've always found the staff to be very protective of their minister or their or their MP to the point where they say, you know, actually you've had too much to drink, or I'd better put you in a taxi and actually take them home and do those sorts of things. So for well, I think that, that was one of the scandals last year with um, oh, from Tuki uh what was her name? The MP uh, Barocca lady. Oh yeah, Anna Law. Anna Law. Anna Law. Yeah, she she wasn't she. Her one of her staffers was upset because they were having to sober drive her all the time. <laughs> I have to yeah. say, I never had to do that for Judith. Judith was always good. <laughs> no, Judith. Judith was always good. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, it's just I, I sit here and watch um, our society falling apart around our ears, and like you, I I lay a lot of the blame um, with our very liberal media that have decided that they're going to pick sides. It used to be mm. that they reported the news. Now they try and make the news. And, mm-hmm. and you know, it was a time that if you wanted to make the news and if you wanted to change laws and you wanted to do those sorts of things, you became an MP. You actually mm-hmm. stood for parliament, got yourself elected, uh, and and then went set about doing it. But the media think that they're, they, they've abrogated their responsibility as the fourth estate, and as a result of doing that, They've brought about an assault, an un, you know, unprecedented assault mm-hmm. on free speech, and yeah. all of these arguments, all of these things that we talk about, um, treaty principles, uh, the turf wars, you know, Posey Parker, all of these things come back to one thing, and that's the right, and under our Bill of Rights, the right to impart 
and receive mm -hmm. information freely. Yeah. And it seems that we're being censored, and, and, and Ardern was the worst of that, you know, the, the podium of truth, the one source of truth, all of that sort of, it was nonsense. Mm -hmm. But yeah. the media went along with it. And so the media is supposed to be at the fourth estate holding the powerful to account. But all too often they're holding hands with the powerful and merrily Absolutely. dancing all over our rights. It's interesting now to see a bit of a shift in them, though, because, I mean, I have this conversation with people a lot where there are people who have very strong views about um, funding of the media and stuff, and I definitely think that, you know, the Public Interest Journalism Fund was not a good idea. However, I don't think those funding scandals, if you will, are what has driven this. What has driven this is purely that the type of person who is a journalist now is a university educated, totally um, liberally kind of indoctrinated through the same universities, um, tend to be from a middle to upper class background, tend to be white, most of them, but have a complex about being white. And so you end up with no matter which mainstream media platform you're looking at, they're all the same because they come with the same set of views. They've had the same education. They've got the same social background. They believe the same things. Whereas back in the day, you could go from one um, publication to another and get very different views. So mm. you had, had some variety. You also had, you know, working class people who didn't go to university but were switched on people um, going straight into journalism and mm. providing that perspective. And so... We're kind of we're not being served because it, it's like this club of people. It's are a homogenized view, isn't it? it? Everything's been become homogenized. But if you look at Reality Check Radio, look, I don't agree with Paul Brennan on a, a large number of things, but he's he's a, do that. but he's a good bloke to have a cigar <laughs> and a drink with, right? Um, I'm never going to agree 100 percent with what Peter Williams says or or Natalie or any of the other you know brilliant hosts that we've got. Everybody's got their own interests and their own points of view. But the great thing in, in Reality Check Radio is that we can all coexist, green voters and, you know, wombles and all sorts of people with different views. Mm. We all can, can join together because we've got this core belief uh, that, that we are exactly what we, our name says, that we're a reality check. We are uh, allowing people with differing views to air their views in a long mm -hmm. format, you know, it's not a 15 minute, let's see if we can get some hits on somebody. Mm -hmm. And and it's better listening. It's better radio. And mm -hmm. that's why our audience is growing. And that's why we're actually taking a stick to the mainstream media that all once over lightly. And mm -hmm. um we and they would, have, they, would, they would be very derisive of you guys. I, like they, 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 they have this, been, yeah. Is, you know, um, this this idea that um, that what you're doing is less than because it's not um, mm. legacy, it's not done as they do, which is hand in hand with um, the public service, with the with um, elements of the government, though less so now. You guys are more prone to misinformation because they don't agree with you, I guess. And but, and but we've got yeah. we've even got people who are in the same space as us who are calling us. Um, you know, derisive names, um, you know, cooker radio or or rabbit hole radio and stuff like that. Um, you know, that says more about him than it does about us. We don't actually don't care because we're here about the discourse and the conversation. And yeah. um, that's why we've got people like yourself talking to us, you know, on the show about politics, about freedom of speech, about the challenging issues that are out there, calling things as they are. Yeah, and I think um, I'm always quite happy to, you know, talk to people in good faith because I think um, the more of these conversations that we have about tricky issues, the more we can find that awful thing called middle ground and pragmatism and all these kind of things to, to find a way through challenges because mm. the way I see it right now, the, 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 the way the, the legacy media and um, – the kind of discourses, there is no middle ground to be found on these issues. Like, like nor should they be. I mean, nor should they be. Like, it's okay to not agree. Right? Absolutely. Right? It is okay it's perfectly agree. okay to not agree. 
we, mm. we, we probably would is- the challenge that, that that I worry about is these issues to do with governance and policy like the Treaty Principles Bill, where this polarisation is being weaponized, and at the end of it, one side is going to be pleased and one is going to be really angry instead of trying to have a conversation that bridges some of those... Well, we saw that, didn't we, you know? with Waitangi Day, because you had the media oh. that were amping the pressure up. You could almost think that they were hoping mm. for violence. They were talking I about like they were. Like the day before, I was full of dread. I thought, oh, God, this is going to be horrendous because I, I felt like the media were hoping something really bad would happen. And, you know, I, on the whole, even though there was some hostility, I think it was pretty good. You know, everyone showed up, said their bit. Um, I think it was reported pretty shoddily, especially in, in terms of acts involvement. I mean, mm. Nicole McKee, um, her speech and, and the way she was tickled was pretty awful. Mm. And she was uh, trying to give... Um, that's because house. that's because Nicole and David and Winston and Shane, they're the wrong sort of Maori. That's the prevailing attitude. It's like you're the wrong sort of woman as well. I'm the wrong sort of lesbian as well. That's what I always get. And it, it's quite extraordinary to me. Like I, I wrote a piece recently about um, the Green Party because they drive me nuts. I used to vote for them when I was younger, so I, I, I think it's why. But, you know, the fact that they are front and centre at Pride, screaming the place down, waving flags and acting like they're our babysitters or something, when they have spent the entire first part of this term of parliament supporting terrorist organisation, one of which has just sentenced 30, um, 13 sorry, um, yep. homosexual men to death, plus about 60 are getting corporal punishment. You know, this is the Houthis where, where um, Marima Davidson is on record in the House of Parliament defending their, their right to attack civilian and freight ships because they're upset about what's happening in Gaza. And she's, this was during the ministerial statement. That'll, that be, that'll be Gaza where they tow homosexuals behind motorcycles and throw them off yeah. tall buildings. That, yeah. I mean, that Gaza. Exactly. And so I've kind of gone, actually, the Greens shouldn't be welcome at Pride until they stop supporting groups that kill homosexuals. Like, mm. That's how they would be if the shoe was on the other foot, you know. Yes, but 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 they've got a cloak, they've got a shield of sanctimony and a cloak of invisibility that shields them from all of the that that, that they don't you know, hypocrisy knows no bounds with the Greens. No. I mean, I think to be honest, they're they're in for a a rapid tumble um with the exit of James Shaw. Um, whatever your opinions on James, and I know some people have issues with his university transcripts or something, but um I don't care. I never went to university. <laughs> yeah, I did, but I um some I, I think I must have been in the last batch before indoctrination. But um like whatever whatever you kind of think of James Shaw. I, t- I tell a lie, I did go to university for one yeah, um, but the politics lectures I found incredibly boring because I'd spent a lifetime in politics and here was this professor who'd spent, you know, a lifetime lecturing about politics and the two things were completely different. <laughs> I, just don't really I had mind. lived experience and he had book learning. Mm-hmm. No, it was never going to work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think that, that James Shaw's, um, his sensibleness will be, severely missed in the Greens because even though he is um, a bit bonkers on some stuff, he was the kind of dad. He was reasonable. He was Mm. reasonable. You could talk to him. The times that I've met him, I found him to be a very nice man who was capable of discussing um, Mm. views that he didn't agree. We had a good chat, you know. But um, I think... Without him, you're left with co-leaders, Marama, presuming Chloe, who don't like each other, and will be in a Marama is very competitive. And I can, I can see Chloe getting a, a, a fist of fives um, in the back <laughs> rooms of Parliament from Marama at some point. <laughs> I can just see that it's something that you know we can all look forward to. But yeah, I agree with you. I think yeah. the Greens are deluded. They they think that they. Um, had a brilliant uh, campaign that their arguments uh, had merit, 
and they've they failed. They just the, the the drop off from labour. No, yeah, that's, that's exactly up. right. They've they yeah. they've they lacked they lacked the humility to recognise that they picked up um, people off labour because they couldn't bring themselves to vote labour, so they voted green. Mm, and exactly. at the next election, they're going to go back. Yeah, exactly. It's what happens, you know. Um, and and it's it's actually amazing on the right side of politics that David has grown. I say David, I should say ACT now, but ACT has grown again because mm. they should have seen a swing back. But that's something that National probably needs to think about as to why when they grew, they didn't pick up um, yeah. those ACT voters again. Um, and I think we can all probably um, quite easily see why. But um, it, it, it's it's Taylor's oldest time. The pattern's always there when the when the main parties are not serving their their base. Um, they they go to the next best thing, which is those um, ones on the periphery, um, and that's why that's why Greens are so big this time. And I think that we were, we're in for a term of payoffs from them because Marama and Chloe will be trying to outdo each other rather than work together. And whereas James would make concessions, Chloe will not make concessions. Um, and so I think we'll be in for a, a bit of a ride with them. Yeah, she had Chloe has right, righteous indignation on her side all the time. Right? She's yeah. absolutely adamant. She's a hundred percent right, and will not countenance anybody saying anything different. No. The only thing I can't work out is whether it was Marima or Chloe or both that were involved in stabbing Golres, because I reckon that's an inside job. Do you reckon it's an inside job? Because I know, um, obviously, that the thing that disturbs me most about the Golres situation is that that story was shocked around a little bit before it was it made its way to ZB. Mm. And other media didn't want to publish it. Think about like what a massive thing it's become now. She's lost If that had been a national MP that was um, oh. shoplifting, we would never have heard the end of it. But it was all, oh, no, she's a woman of colour. Um, you know, it's understandable. Um, it's stressful, her job, blah, blah, excuse, excuse, excuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you're a thief. Yeah, well, that's I mean, that was one of my pieces that has had the most anger directed at it that isn't about trans stuff because that usually gets the most anger. No, because you were attacking a woman of colour. <laughs> but it was because I said that actually, you know, we can say sympathy for your mental health. That's really awful, you know. It's just a crutch you know. that, that politicians is, use, isn't it, to get out yeah. of the, the hard stuff. Oh, I was a bit sad. I'm feeling depressed. You know, everybody has – New Zealand's one of the high, highest medicated yeah. pe um, countries in the world. Almost everybody you meet is on some sort of antidepressant, right? Yeah, so, been, so we I've don't use it very, as a crutch. <laughs> I've been very outspoken over the years. I have bipolar disorder and I yeah. have had to spend a lot of time with doctors and therapists learning how to live with it, take medication. If I shoplifted – I myself would take responsibility for it. But you can bet my dad and my partner and my sisters would all be like, that's on you. They wouldn't be saying, oh, you've, you've got bipolar, how sad. Yeah. Um, they'd be saying, what the were you doing shoplifting? <laughs> exactly. <You know? laughs> yeah. and Lucky you didn't do it when you were at my house. I would have taken you to the police by myself. <laughs> Well, they would. My dad would totally be the parent who would blum and drive us there and say, right, she's been shoplifting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's the thing, isn't it? We've got the society now where there are almost no consequences for outrageous behaviour. And mm. you can explain it away. Oh, no, can't you understand? I'm an oppressed um, trans person. And, you know, I'm a vulnerable person. Oh, no, Ma Maori, it's understandable why they do um, that because they're vulnerable. Yeah, you know, we saw this all the time in the COVID rubbish. Uh, you know, the these are vulnerable really communities, oh, vulnerable old people, vulnerable Maori, vulnerable Pacific Islanders. It, if you tell someone they're vulnerable long enough and loud enough, guess what? They'll believe they'll be, it. They'll believe it, right? Yeah. And on the other yeah. hand, you've got you know, Rari Waititi who says that Maori have got superior DNA and all that, but then he's got his hand out for the vulnerable payments. So which is, is it? Which is it, mate? <laughs> yeah, I I just think it's um the bigotry of low expectations is mm. 
is significant in this country and that what people forget is when they say this group of people needs help because they're not capable of doing it themselves. You're saying that you are capable and you're able to... It's condescending, it isn't it? It's yeah. condescending, it's it's paternalistic mm. uh, and it's old-fashioned, but politicians keep doing it. It's well, it's, it's another thing that if they don't hit those buzzwords they get the bad headline, you know. You look at, I mean, I watch PostCab most weeks because I, I don't know. I guess you're a I political tragic like me. <laughs> <laughs> and you look at the questions. It doesn't matter what the Prime Minister is talking about. He could be talking about the price of bread or he could be talking about, I don't know, the Olympics or something. They will always stick to the formulaic questions of you'll hear about what does this mean for Māori? Um, don't you think that the poor would da 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 da? And it, it, everything is squeezed into that narrative instead of it being um It's, it's like off. the response to Louise Upston's um, comments. They go oh, and get um, a whole lot of you know vulnerable beneficiaries who are I'm frightened about what's going to happen. Oh, and that's what the news. You know what's my favorite thing to do is when they those people that they put on like the morning shows or in the news of vulnerable people Google them, and you they're always all find activists. Them. They're all activists, or they're all like members of the Labour Party who you know like yeah. always without fail. <laughs> David Farrow would used to write articles. He used to put posts on his blog. He said, "Oh, that's a terrible story." Of course, what the um, news uh, media forgot to mention, or the journalist and stuff forgot to mention, is that this person is a branch, um, uh, a branch chairman of the Labour Party. Yeah, yeah. You know, they, yeah. they've got this list of aggrieved people for almost any um, mm -hmm. perceived um, trouble that have got a, a, a handy little spout sound bite about how worse off they're going to be. And, yeah. and the flip side of that is if we just kept on spending money, that'd all be okay. That's been the, like, um, I just watched Question Time, um, again, tragic, but I did. And Louise Upston was, she fielded, I think, three questions maybe um, because of the welfare announcement. Essentially, what she is saying is that life is harder for people on the benefit. So it let's is. try and help them off the benefit. Yeah. And that, that is what she's saying. She's not saying they're bad people. She's not saying let's take everything off them right away. Let's, you know, it's life's hard. So let's make it better. R Ricardo uh, Menendez March's question I was like, are you seriously saying? that the government shouldn't have obligations on beneficiaries who are on job seeker to attend meetings and to try and get a job. Because that's what he was saying. He's, he's basically saying you can't prove that this helps them to get a job, so you should just leave them alone. Just give them the money and leave them alone. Right. It's, it's, it's incredible because... That's why I call him El Woco Loco. <laughs> Oh my God, he's. The, I don't know if they've made him like the little shadow leader of the house or something. He's just he's a doing, whinger. But he's doing all these points of order now, and and they're always really bad, like or wrong. Jerry Brownlee will just laugh at him. <laughs> Isn't Jerry a bit better speaker than Trevor? I mean, you know. Oh God, I know. I loved just, Adrian though. I did think Adrian. Yeah, Adrian was, was good. Better. Yeah, I thought um, I thought he was a good speaker. But um, Jerry's getting into his own. I think one of his biggest challenges is going to be... Um, breathing. Breathing. <laughs> and God bless our Deputy Prime Minister, but he he has to rein him in because Winston is just jumping up at the drop of a hat for points of order that are probably not points of order. They're just him making a point, you know? Yeah. Um, and so he has to... And Winston will keep doing that if he's got free reign to do it because... That's Winston. But isn't like, it wonderful to watch? You know, oh, it is. It's hilarious. Like I keep um, sharing he, some of the clips. He gave he gave James Shaw a good smack last week when he made some comment. He says, "Oh, you should just be thankful I'm not talking about academic credentials." Just <laughs> <laughs> sit down. Anyway, <laughs> Eddie, on, on that yeah. note, we've run out of time. Really, it's been a real pleasure chatting to you about free speech and everything else, including the speakers and <laughs> what they're doing. We'll have to have you on again. It's been a real pleasure. It was um, lovely to, to meet you finally as well. Yeah. <laughs> no, likewise, <laughs> likewise. And he's at the forefront of what I termed the turf wars. But the core thrust of that debate is actually a free speech debate.
These are important debates that need to be had. And we need to avoid cancel culture and all that means with deplatforming and the silencing of people with differing views. And that's why we here at RCR always will explore both sides of any issue. Let me know your thoughts on this topic, good or bad, by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you. So connect with us today.